Welcome to a new edition of Euro Questions, our bi-monthly webinars where we present the Jacques Delors Institute's research and analyze European news. Today, we will be focusing our session on uh, the topic of cybersecurity and the risks and challenges it poses for the EU. And to discuss this topic, uh, we are delighted to greet uh, Arnaud Barrichella, uh, Re Associate Research Fellow in Cybersecurity at the Jacques Delors Institute. Indeed, given the acceleration of the digital revolution and the exponential increase in the number of cyber attacks affecting nearly all sectors, reinforcing EU policies and legislations has to be an utmost priority for decision makers across Europe. The Russian invasion of Ukraine further emphasizes the importance of this. Cyber attacks aim to destabilize countries, targeting critical infrastructure, banking and financial systems, along with military and governmental networks. The Russian army has continuously relied on hybrid war warfare tactics, combining cyber attack with military action in Ukraine. Before handing over the floor to our speaker, I would simply like to remind you that the Q&A tool is available at the bottom of your screen. Uh, you can forward your questions uh, to our speaker and I will relay them in the second part of this 30-minute uh, webinar. Uh, without further ado, I hand the floor over to, to our speaker for today. So, hello, everybody. It's a pleasure being here today. My name is Arno Barrichello. I am an associate research fellow in uh, so cybersecurity at the Jacques Delors um, Institute, and I have just written a paper on the cybersecurity dimension of the war in Ukraine, which will be the subject um, of my discussion uh, today. Uh, so it's, first of all, important to emphasize that there has been an ongoing cyber confrontation between Ukraine, the West, and Russia, at least since uh, the events of 2014, which led to the annexation of Crimea and the uh, outbreak of military conflict in the Donbass region. Indeed, the Russian-backed hackers have unleashed some of the most devastating cyber attacks in history over the last few years. Just to name a couple of examples, there was the NotPetya virus in 2017, which is uh, even up to this day uh, so considered to be one of the worst, if not the worst, the cyber attack ever perpetrated. And uh, uh, so actually, uh, while it uh, uh, so initially targeted Ukraine, it then spread globally. Then there were uh, uh, um, there was uh, also the solar winds attack in uh, 2020 uh, that is uh, still considered up to this day to be the worst cyber espionage um, operation ever to be launched against the United States, uh, Europe, uh, and NATO. Uh, and uh, um, I, even though uh, the problem uh, of attribution means that uh, it's very difficult to precisely determine who is responsible for these types of uh, cyber um, attacks, Western intelligence has confirmed that Russian-backed hackers are most likely behind them. So, for these reasons, there was widespread uh, anticipation that the latest outbreak uh, of uh, military hostilities in Ukraine uh, in February uh, of, uh, of this year would lead to a new wave of uh, devastating cyber attacks. While it's true that actually cyber uh, security has played a key role in the Ukraine conflict, this has not unfolded in the way that many experts had um, anticipated. So firstly, in, um, in Ukraine um, itself, instead of large-scale uh, so cyber assaults being launched by, uh, by the Russian military or Russian-backed hackers, we have seen a campaign of sustained uh, so cyber harassment since February, which has targeted not only governmental or military um, entities, but also the media, banking, uh, so financial uh, um, institutions, as well as many different aspects of a, a civil uh, society as well. So what Russia has tried to do is to launch medium to low scale uh, cyber um, attacks as a form of harassment, um, often as part of uh, a symbolic or psychological warfare. 
Some examples um, uh, include the posting of fake online videos of Ukrainian President Zelensky uh, um, asking the population to surrender. These were fake, of course, but these are just some examples of the, the types of uh, symbolic hackings which have been uh, uh, so taking place. Uh, but another very important aspect of the war in Ukraine has been a Russia's decision to mobilize a form of hybrid uh, a warfare, hybrid in the sense that uh, so cyber attacks have been uh, used in tandem and in combination with military strikes on the ground. And uh, uh, at least during the initial phase of the Ukraine war, these had actually been a fairly uh, successful for, for Russia and uh, uh, which means uh, that uh, um, the war in Ukraine in many ways represents the first truly hybrid military conflict. So in terms of the European and the international dimension, um, there was of course widespread um, apprehension that the war in Ukraine would lead to a series of uh, devastating Russian cyber attacks on, uh, on Europe and on the West more generally. It is true that Russia has targeted a number of countries in Europe, especially in Eastern Europe, like Poland and Romania, that have served as key transit uh, routes to deliver military material uh, to Ukraine. They've also served as key bases to welcome refugees. Um, also, we've seen uh, um, uh, you know, renewed hackings in terms of spying um, operations being uh, conducted. Uh, yet, it's interesting to note that Russia seems to have targeted its uh, cyber attacks on the West uh, in, uh, in an attempt to amplify its disinformation warfare. Indeed, there is evidence that uh, despite the banning of uh, Russian TV networks like, like Sputnik or Russia today, Russia has sought to find new ways uh, to accelerate its disinformation campaigns uh, um, against the West. Now, it's it's difficult to uh, to determine uh, exactly what impact these have had. Yet, there are a number of opinion surveys which seem to show that opinion in Europe has begun to fracture over the Ukraine war, and that a majority of people in Europe now seem to be opposed to a long and protracted warfare, as the economic costs of supporting Ukraine have become more apparent. So um, now you might be wondering, why has the cyber security dimension of the war um, in Ukraine not turned out in the way that many had um, anticipated? So the first and the foremost factor has been a remarkable resilience, uh, a remarkable uh, uh, so cyber resilience on the part of Ukraine. It's, it appears like Ukraine has uh, learned from past mistakes and has invested considerable resources and efforts in terms of bolstering its uh, cyber defenses over the last few years. In this regard, Ukraine has, of course, received notable support from NATO, Europe, and from the United States. Yet another factor has also been linked to the relatively poor preparation of Russia as a cyber offensive against Ukraine. Indeed, it seems like um, Russian hackers so were not given enough advance notice to prepare new types uh, um, of malware to, to launch against Ukraine and the West because it seems like most of the cyber attacks that have been launched only a consensus in um, updated versions of previous viruses that Ukraine and the West had been able uh, to build up defenses against. So this appears to indicate uh, once again that Russia had been betting on uh, a short or lightened uh, you know, strike that would uh, bring down the government in Kyiv in a matter of days. As a corollary of this factor, Russia had not made um, um, efforts to, uh, to, to sufficiently protect its communication lines. And this means that in many cases, it has actually had to rely on local Ukrainian communications infrastructure for its military um, invasion. That is why the launching of, uh, of major types of uh, cyber attacks on Ukraine risks actually spilling over onto Russian forces and might have caused as much uh, damage to Russian forces as to Ukrainian ones. 
Yet there are also other notable factors. So firstly, the impact of uh, Western economic sanctions seems to have been important because it, it, uh, it has made the connecting uh, of uh, certain types of uh, cyber attacks like ransomware much more difficult because Russian banks and financial institutions have been cut off from the global financial network. Also, another factor is uh, the brain drain of, of Russian IT professionals. In, indeed, since the beginning of the war, close to 100,000 Russian IT have, um, experts have left Ukraine. That's up to 10% of Russia's um, IT workforce, and uh, especially one, th one third of the younger generation of, of Russian IT experts, which raises questions in terms of Russia's ability to uh, continue performing in this vital sector in the future. And the final factor which I like to emphasize is the fear of retaliation. Indeed, NATO um, has made clear that uh, uh, a cyber attack on uh, a member country would lead to a devastating response. Uh, given that Russia uh, has already faced uh, many difficulties uh, in its invasion of Ukraine, it seems to have been a risk that it has not been willing to take, at least for the time being. This is especially true since uh, NATO has indicated on a number of occasions that a major uh, cyber attack on a member country could lead to the triggering of Article 5, whereby an attack on one is considered to be an attack on all. Therefore, we have seen, to the surprise of many, what can be described as a uh, so cyber cold war. Uh, since last February, both sides have been probing the possibilities of launching more serious types of attacks, yet this has not yet materialized for the time being. But it should be noted that the risk of escalation is genuine and should not be underestimated. Indeed, uh, so many analysts have said that President uh, Putin sees the war in Ukraine as one that, that he cannot afford to lose. Indeed, yesterday, he, uh, uh, so President Putin has once again threatened to use nuclear weapons due to the situation in Ukraine. Although many fear uh, uh, a nuclear war, the prospect of that happening uh, still remains low due to the risk of mutually assured destruction. A much less perilous uh, a strategy for Russia might be instead to launch a full-scale cyber assault on, on the West, despite the risk of retaliation and despite the risk of these attacks also spreading uh, into Russia um, itself. That is why it is essential for Europe not to let down its, uh, its guard and to continue reinforcing um, its assistance to Ukraine. One way so the European Union has been doing this is through these, uh, the cyber rapid response teams, which have proven effective um, up until now, and it's essential to reinforce these in the coming months. Also, it's essential for Europe to, to, to prepare itself against the possibility of uh, direct and large-scale cyber attacks targeting member states of the European Union itself, as has happened over the last few years. So Europe has enacted a number of important policies and legislation in this field over the last uh, a few years, uh, the most notable of which is uh, the NIST Directive, as well as the EU Cyber Security Act in 2019. So while Europe has achieved a lot and has made any, uh, much progress in the field of uh, so cybersecurity over the last few years, there is still the problem of weak links, whereby member states are still given a lot of autonomy in the implementation process of European norms. This has led to uh, a framework uh, so whereby the efficiency of cyber norms across member states is highly variable. Some countries like, uh, like France or the UK um, have some of the most advanced cybersecurity frameworks in the world, yet others, um, so in part due to, uh, to lack of resources or adequate um, infrastructure, haven't been able to, uh, to follow up. This is why it is essential for Europe to reinforce the harmonization of, of norms at the EU level. Two, uh, two notable 
pieces of legislation have been introduced recently. One is the NIS two directive, and the other is the e the the EU uh, Cyber Resiliency Act. Both uh, uh, constitute notable um, improvements, but they unfortunately they unfortunately still do not go far enough in terms of what needs to be done uh, to tackle the problem of of weak links. The problem of weak links uh, is a real issue because member states that have the least developed frameworks in terms of uh, cyber uh, security may constitute um, doors where viruses um, can, can, uh, can penetrate Europe before spreading uh, to infect other member states and potentially impacting the entire network. Thank you very much for, for this presentation. Uh, I'd like to jump straight away in the, in the questions. Uh, maybe first question, uh, you ended up on uh, talking about um, a European, uh, a European Union uh, reforms in the domain of uh, cybersecurity. Uh, could you detail a little bit more the NIS and the NIS2 directives? Absolutely. So the NIS and NIS2 directive constitute the two main pieces of legislation at the EU level for the protection of critical infrastructure. They are uh, very uh, important uh, pieces of legislation that, uh, that have gone a long way in terms of establishing common EU norms in the field of uh, cyber uh, security. Yet even the uh, latest NIS 2 directive may not go far enough in terms of what needs to be uh, done to address the problem of weak links, but it's still uh, a clear step in the right direction. Thank you very much. Another question you talked about uh, NATO, about uh, uh, potential uh, uh, use of Article 5 in case of cyber attacks. Uh, one interesting question we're getting is, uh, is Europe uh, also, in, in addition to um, putting in place defensive uh, strategies against cyber attacks, is uh, Europe uh, developing uh, offensive strategies in terms of uh, cyber, uh, cyber attacks? Absolutely. So I would say that these types of offensive strategies would apply more to member states like like France or the UK uh, or uh, the United States, which are the foremost military powers in the NATO um, alliance. And yes, absolutely. Uh, it is um, it is very uh, important to have uh, a credible dissuasion force to be able to tell Russia if you attack as we will retaliate. And it's worked because, as I said uh, before, there has been a sort of, uh, of cyber cold war that has emerged since last February. And both sides have, for the time being, held off on launching uh, you know, major assaults on one another in the cyber realm. Another another question uh, regards uh, the brain drain, brain drain you mentioned of uh, young uh, Russian hackers. Um, why is that? Is that due to non-political alignment or is it other reasons, do you think? I think uh, there uh, could be political factors, but especially for for young Russian IT um, experts, I think that, that the main factors might be economic. They might see that due to the sanctions, which uh, you know seem to be having a real impact on, on Russia's economy, they risk not having a professional future uh, in Russia. Yet Russia has up until now had one of the world's most advanced IT sectors. And so these people have, uh, have uh, you know, made the decision to go to other countries, I think in search of a better life and of better professional opportunities. But there might have also been a, a political factor that is very hard to determine. Of course. Um, maybe I'd like to extend uh, extend the, the topic a little bit here. Uh, obviously, we talk a lot about Russia, given uh, the war in Ukraine. Uh, at the moment, um, a participant is asking, is Russia considered a bigger threat than China for the EU slash NATO in terms of uh, cybersecurity and cyber attacks? I would say that yes, yes, for a number um, of reasons. So Europe isn't directly involved in any conflict with China, at least not directly. There is the situation in uh, Taiwan. There uh, is criticism towards what is happening towards the Uyghurs, uh, but there is no, uh, you know, direct confrontation as there is with Ukraine on, you know, on Europe's doorstep. That's why if you look at where the cyber attacks have been coming from over the last decade, most of them have come from 
from Russia. Now, of course, it's never possible to ascertain at 100% where a cyber attack comes from. Yet, there, uh, there is a very high certainty that, uh, you know, um, either, uh, you know, um, a a hacker groups backed by the Kremlin or directly Russian security or military entities like the FSB have been responsible for the types of uh, so cyber attacks and, uh, that have hit uh, Europe uh, and North America o over the last decades, some of which, like uh, um, the uh, uh, the NotPetya uh, or even the uh, the Colonial Pipeline, uh, um, uh, a couple of years ago, are amongst the most uh, devastating cyber attacks to ever have impacted uh, the West. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, all uh, participants uh, for, for their questions. Um, as uh, Arnaud uh, Barrichella mentioned it uh, at the beginning of his presentation, uh, his publication will be out uh, today, this afternoon. Uh, it's entitled uh, The Cybersecurity Dimension of the War in Ukraine and its ramifications for Europe, and it will be sent over to you this afternoon, uh, along with the, the replay to today's session. Uh, the next session will be held in English as well on October 5th uh, on the topic of uh, European sanctions in case of rule of law infringements, uh, and we will greet our senior researcher Eulalia Rubio um, to discuss this, uh, this topic. That will be on Wednesday, October 5th. Uh, thank you again. Thank you, Arnaud, for your detailed presentation. Thank you. And uh, have a very nice afternoon. Bye-bye.